We just defeated Cat Thulu, and now it's time to recover and have a chat. With me today, I have Gerardo, the Gokiburi of Sony Entertainment. Greetings. And me, I am Hunter, and I am also here. We recently got the PlayStation 2023 showcase, which is, I guess, somehow different from the state of play. I... To be completely honest, I don't really get the difference between the two, but we got a state of play a few months ago, and now we have the PlayStation Showcase. Uh, The the showcase is just meant to be like the... Sony intends it to be their large-scale announcement platform. So, like, this is the kind of replacement for the E3, I guess, because we're, like, heading into summer, and it's a few... It's like a little bit early. It's like a good month or two early than we would normally get like an E3 presentation. But I guess this is supposed to be kind of like a replacement for that because they technically pulled out of E3 quite a while ago. They're still on the roster for Summer Game Fest, but I don't believe they'll be making like too many announcements there. I bet they'll show Kojima's games. Right. But I'm not expecting anything else from Sony's first parties for that. Yeah, I'm sure that we might see a couple of like new trailers or something of some of the games that they announced here or like at least showed more stuff of during this presentation but uh i don't think that we're going to get a whole lot of new announcements necessarily so this is basically it then this was the big presentation for the year kind of showing what's gonna come down the pipeline before holiday season during holiday season And looking a little into next year, if I had to guess, not all of these have release dates and stuff, but uh, if I I had to guess, some of these are probably some 2024 releases. Yeah, there were some rumors going around that they might do one more showcase at the end of the year, but that's still early. Yeah, I don't know, because at the end of the year is a weird time that's like before, because that's like when they're still trying to sell their holiday games, you know, and then the winter lineup. Yeah, like the winter lineup, they're trying to, they're still doing that stuff. You know, they're still like trying to sell those games, make sure that they sell well. And so they don't want to suffocate the, like those games too much. You know, like if a brand new, everyone needs to be playing Cat Quest, right? Everyone needs to be playing Cat Quest. So they're not going to be suffocating Cat Quest of all things. Oh, yeah, totally. (laughs) So without further ado, I guess we can go ahead and get into it. Fair games dollar sign? I have no idea what this is, to be completely honest. Oh god. This was a really poor way for them to start the show, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, it looks like a kinda like uh like a payday clone. Maybe not clone. It looks kinda like it's some kind of like payday type game mixed with like Fortnite kind of characters. Yeah, it in looks my like opinion. That. Uh it's supposed to be as the PS blogs post for this game states a pvp game with emergent sandbox gameplay which sounds a little bit more interesting than what the trailer showed but uh, i'm not too confident about this this is going to be one of sony's uh first party live service games and we haven't seen any gameplay or in-game screenshots as far as i could find i don't even really think that i knew that it was pvp it looks like a pve game like a co-op yeah, PVE. Yeah, it does. But uh, according to the blog, it's supposed to be PvP. Uh, okay. Players heisting and the other team defending, I suppose. Okay, so kind of like... Uh, what is it? The Division? You know, you're kind of like breaking... You're kind of like SWAT, like kind of breaking into places. And then you can also play as the other team trying to defend or something. Oh, yeah. Except I... a bit more like corporate E or something like that. Uh, I haven't played too much of The Division, so... I think that that was one of those Tom Clancy games. I think it was The Division. We also had Helldivers 2. This is a Sony... This is also a Sony first-party game, right? Yes. So... I know nothing about this. This game's developed by uh, Arrowhead Game Studios. I've played the first game. The thing that sticks out the most for me about this game is that the first game is actually a twin-stick shooter with an isometric view. And uh, for some reason, this one's a third person shooter. I'm not sure why they felt they needed to change the game genre. But if that's what they really wanted to do, then uh, (laughs) uh, all power to them. I'm just a little reluctant because 
most of Sony's first party games in recent years, like since the mid PS4 era, have been over the shoulder third person action games. Hmm. So it, it does make me a little bit skeptical. But again, if, if this is what Arrowhead really wants, then yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll back them on it. The first game is pretty fun. Uh, and this game looks pretty fun, too. It looks pretty fun. I think that the I, I it's kind of hard to tell what the tone is for this game because they started with like a really gruesome scene and then being kind of like comedy about it. Like, huh, if you don't want this to happen to your entire family, but like, you know, it, it was just kind of like, I don't know, weird. And then I feel like we've gotten to the point where we're heading out of the uncanny valley as far as like game visuals go. Like human faces don't look kind of creepy anymore. They don't look like uh, like they're unsettling. But I feel like this game, the the I don't know if it was maybe the facial capture rigs weren't perfect or something, but it just kind of took me back into the uncanny valley for some reason. I can see what you're saying there. Uh, the first game was pretty similar in tone. Okay, I think uh, it. I think it takes a lot of inspiration from Starship Troopers, the movie. Yeah, I can definitely uh, see the Starship Troopers. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then in this case, uh, I don't know this for sure, but I'm pretty sure Arrowhead is one of Sony's smaller studios. So AAA might not be like uh, the most defining term for this game. Sure. But uh, at least in terms of scale, because the first game wasn't like that big. And then the other thing is a lot of the characters in the game are just like wearing armor the whole time. It's not a very like uh, plot heavy game. Well, it's not a very like close up cut scene heavy game. Uh, type of game story heavy or something yeah yeah, yeah. they probably don't need to put that much time into like facial animations so this trailer was yeah this trailer did show uh like facial animations up close i think it looked pretty good for what it was and that goes a little bit back into them changing like the genre of the game and like why that worries me a little bit Mm -hmm. i'm worried that changing it from a twin stick shooter to a third person shooter actually makes the game seem more generic than it did before true yeah some franchises have done that, like uh, Grand Theft Auto went from a top down shooter to being a over the shoulder third person game. And I think yeah, that that's, that's mostly to its benefit. So I think that we'll have yeah. to see how this one turns out, turns out. I think that this is probably a little bit lower scope than something like a GTA, but I, I don't know. We haven't seen a whole lot of it, so we'll have to see. Yeah. So the next game they showed at the showcase was an EA game. It was called Immortals of Avium by Ascendant Studios. Uh, It's like a magic based first person shooter. No, that's fair enough. Yeah, I think that the idea of a magic based first person shooter is kind of interesting, but it's uh, it's PvP, right? Oh, it's single player. It is single. The main character's name is Jack, spelled just like Jack and Daxter. Oh, interesting okay interesting choice all right so the next game that they showed was ghost runner 2 which i did play the first game a little bit uh this is like a first person free running like slasher type game it's a lot like super meat boy but in 3d you just like you start a level you try to get through it. If you die, you instantly restart the level. It's just keep going at it until you get the the rhythm down. You, you figure out how to, how to get past it without getting hit. Because you uh, you die in one hit in this in the first game. Okay. After Ghost Runner, the next game they showed in the showcase was Phantom Blade Zero, developed by S Game. This game's probably my favorite game that was shown in the showcase. It actually just looks really awesome the combat looks awesome the visual style looks really cool to me yeah even though like ghost of tsushima exists so it's kind of like it's got that like asian swordsman ship aesthetic going sure i was uh, thinking dynasty warriors when i first saw it oh yeah that's fair too but the combat in this game looks fairly unique i was looking up on this game and it's actually a spiritual successor to a longer series that like is mostly china exclusive called rain blood um, okay 
the developer described it as a spiritual rebirth of the original game. And uh, that original game was a 2D action RPG. The trailer for this game had uh, a lot of variety in it. It was pretty long for like a trailer that just came out of nowhere from an yeah. indie dev. It had a lot of action scenes. It had some scenes that looked really cool, uh, like a fight on a moving carriage, uh, a boss battle that had like some environmental interaction. You had to hide by a p- behind a pillar, running up walls and stuff. That gave off a little bit of Prince of Persia vibes. Uh, the one thing about this trailer that kind of throws me off is that it, it it almost looks too good. It looks almost too seamless was like the, okay. the vibe that I was getting from it. Uh, the next game they showed was Sword of the Sea by Giant Squid. Right at the beginning of this trailer, I got some heavy journey vibes from it. Yeah, it's from the same, uh, I guess, creative director or something like that of Journey, right? Yeah, uh, Journey and Abzu. Okay. Uh, I played both of those games. I I really like both of them. Yeah, I haven't played Abzu, haven't played The Pathless, but I played Journey. Oh yeah, I haven't played The Pathless yet. Um, I went to the website for the game. It's The website describes it as like an exploration-based snowboarding kind of game. It says it you go to ruins like that, yeah. that are uh, shaped kind of like skate parks, which I thought that was pretty interesting. After that, they showed the Talos Principle 2. Uh, I haven't played the first game, but it's been one that has been on my radar for a while. I just haven't put the time into playing it. The trailer didn't show any gameplay, but the shots of the environmental design that it showed really caught my attention. Yeah, I I have I started the Talos Principle. I haven't played through it. I know I need to. I I really like the way that the story is delivered. You kind of you get bits and pieces as you're completing the puzzles, but then also there is these like extra objectives you can do to kind of gain this like digital log kind of thing and kind of explore a bit more of the history and stuff like that and where these like androids are going from there and it's kind of it's kind of like portal in a way i don't know it's interesting the kind of way that like they're testing you and keeping an eye on like the way that you solve the problems and stuff it's uh but then also like building a civilization i don't know it's really interesting i need to actually sit down and play through the talos principle but uh yeah, now that there's a sequel coming out, definitely, because this looks really freaking good and so beautiful. Okay, so next we also got another game being published by Devolver. I really like most of the games that they've published. Uh, this one's developed by Nomada Studio called Neva. These are the creators of, is it Gris or Gree? I think it's pronounced Gree. I haven't played that game yet, but I've that's that's another one that I've been meaning to play for a long time Mm -hmm. because it just looks so beautiful from this trailer i'd say this game looks very beautiful also oh yeah on steam they have screenshots from the game and it appears to be another side scrolling platformer like gree okay so i'm assuming the game's probably gonna play fairly similar with its own mechanics its own story deal kind of yeah because gree's whole deal was like kind of returning color to the world and this is a world with a lot of color i i I can't tell if it's hand drawn art or not. I don't think it is because Grease was Grease was all hand drawn. Oh, it was interesting. Yeah, this I think is a little bit more digitally animated. All right, and then the next game they showed is Cat Quest: Pirates yeah. of the Caribbean. Cat this Quest is published by Kepler Interactive and being developed by the Gentle Bros. Oh. And according to Cat Quest's website. This game is releasing in 2024. (laughs) Love it. So this is actually the third game in the Cat Quest series. Yes, it is. Uh, I haven't played any of them. I have. I actually didn't know about them before now, but this game looks so good to me that I really want to play the other ones. I have them on the Switch and we are on. Oh, no, it might be on my girlfriend's technically but uh you can jump into her eShop because we're all in the same family plan and then oh, yeah. you should play the first two the first one is i think single player only but the second one uh, is co-op so you can uh have a friend hop in and join and play with you nice yeah i love local co-op yeah it's a, just really dumb fun i think there's a few things where like you're kind of level grindy type things but it's just an adorable game i like how even the uh 
when they when the cats like save points of the game, their little heads just kind of drop. <laughs> just for the record, I don't even like cats, but I love this. I'm more of a dog person, but I, that doesn't mean I hate cats. I think cats are pretty solid also. I just mainly right. like dogs. And actually, Cat Quest 2 introduces dogs. Oh, it does? Yeah, you can play as dogs in Cat Quest. Cool. Yeah. And then the next game that they introduced was Splatoon. I mean, Foam Stars. Uh, it's <laughs> it's a 4v4 multiplayer <laughs> shooter. Um, I really like Splatoon. I mean, uh, this is Foam Stars. And, um, you know, it's kind of weird. I, I didn't think that they would go for like Fortnite visuals for Splatoon for the next Splatoon game. Oh, oh yeah. no, this is Foam Stars. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think it's uh, it is <laughs> extremely similar to Splatoon. Uh, I'm on the fence of calling it a ripoff or a like a copy of Splatoon because the stylistically it looks different, but then mechanically it's like basically identical. I I am trying to be positive about this and think Splatoon has been around for a while and calling it a Splatoon like. Yeah, this brings an interesting uh, potential debate to the table here. At what point does a game style become a genre? If if it's basically just this game and Splatoon, then <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. There's no way that the fair. There's no way that the designers weren't playing Splatoon and writing notes down. You know. Yeah. It, it's it's Splatoon. Calling out Square Enix here. All right, and the uh, the next game that was shown is another Devolver release, The Plucky Squire, developed by All Possible Futures. Uh, we've seen this game uh, in a few showcases. Last E3, I think the visual style looks fantastic. It looks like it has a lot of variety mm -hmm. to it. Just impressive overall to me. So after The Plucky Squire, uh, the next game shown was Teardown by Tuxedo Labs. So this is actually a port of a game that is already released on Steam. It has high praises on Steam. It's a sandbox style game. You're performing heists and it's like you have to figure out how to complete the heist with the game's block destroying gameplay feature. Yeah, so I think the art style is typically referred to as voxel. They're like oh, yeah. 3D pixel art, kind of. Yeah. Uh, I actually think this game looks really fun. And for being the second heist game in this showcase, <laughs> I think it looks a lot better than Fair Games. I think I probably would play it. I'd be more likely to play it. Yeah, I'm definitely interested in playing this. I didn't know it existed until uh, this showcase. Same, yeah. All right, so next up in the showcase, they hit us with a real banger, at least for me personally. Yeah. Uh, they tried to be slick with this trailer. Uh, it was like supposed to be a surprise reveal. I think it was about halfway through where I kind of realized what it is. We, we already kind of knew about this game because of like rumors. Okay. Uh, we got Metal Gear Solid Delta snake eater this is gonna be a full remake of metal gear solid 3 yeah my initial reactions is that i'm a bit reluctant but hopeful i think metal gear solid 3 is an example of a near perfect video game in my opinion and of course coming from me uh metal gear is actually my favorite video game franchise so i might be a little bit biased there but this trailer was interesting it's a full cgi trailer but they've actually shown some screenshots from the game outside of the showcase, uh, if you look for them. Uh, from the screenshots, you can tell that the game looks like it's going to be structurally the same as the original. Uh, you could find the same locations in the original game that are in the screenshots. It just looks like they're recreating the assets, like the other similar remakes that have come out recently. Uh, Resident Evil 4 specifically is a good example, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other likely thing is that they said they're going to update like the user experience for modern gaming audience, which to me, that means redone controls. Hopefully not too much more than that. I don't want them to change this game too much, personally. A weird specific word they used for that was a seamless user experience. And that actually made me think of something really interesting because 
progression in the original game is level based, but the levels are broken up into pieces, like sections that you travel through, and then there's load screens between them. Mm-hmm. Seamless user experience, what that tells to me, because the game, you can backtrack in the game freely, if you like, to a certain extent, as the story allows. Mm hmm. So seamless user experience to me feels like they've removed the load screens if you really read into it. That's what I feel like, yeah. Yeah, so the level design might be like a continuous progression, which that'd be pretty cool. Uh, The other cool thing is that they announced the original voice cast will return, uh, which specifically means that Snake is going to be played by David Hayter again. Hmm. And I'm expecting them to redo the voice dialogue since back in the ps2 era a lot of voice acting dialogue was a bit rough for a lot of games even like some of the most fantastic games have really rough voice acting uh especially for japanese releases i feel like so i could definitely see them doing that yeah, they'll probably try their hardest. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe there's a few differences. Yeah, definitely. And they, uh, the original game has a lot of random character interaction dialogue. Specifically, okay. like whenever you save the game, you save the game by calling a specific character in the game. And when you save, the character tells you about a movie that she watched and she likes. And they talk about the movie for a second. So I could I could even see them adding more dialogue to that. And there there were already was a lot of dialogue for those interactions. But that's just me speculating. Yeah, I'm interested to see how they how they approach that kind of thing. And since you say that Metal Gear Solid 3 was one of the best games in the franchise, I think that this one's going to do really well. It's definitely one that I'm going to check out. And in a way, not not to suddenly become negative. That's one of the things that worries me about this game. And that worries me about remakes in general. Since mm. Metal Gear Solid 3, in my opinion, is already such a perfect game, I worry that the remake is going to mess it up. And then like modern audiences are going to become introduced to the series with the remake. Mm. And if the remake's not as good as the original, then they'll, they'll probably feel like they don't need to play the original because they already played the remake. Sure. But then they're missing out on the better experience if the original yeah. is definitely a better experience. I think that making this could be a separate conversation. I think. Um, oh yeah. After you finish playing Final Fantasy VII remake, uh, and then because you're also playing through Final Fantasy VII alongside it, and uh, yes. I think that that could be a really interesting conversation. And if I play MGS three and then MGS Delta afterwards. Uh, and kind of compare our experiences playing the original and then playing the remake afterwards. I think that we can have probably a separate episode just talking about the nature of remakes. That's a good point. And that's something that you'll easily be able to do because they also announced the Metal Gear Solid Master Collection yeah. Volume 1, which contains the original Metal Gear Solid 3, <laughs> along so with Metal Gear 1, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, Metal Gear Solid 1, along with the standalone expansion Metal Gear Solid VR Missions, Mm -hmm. and Metal Gear Solid 2. It's basically a port of the HD collection from the 360 and the PS3 era, but with Metal Gear Solid 1 included on it. I'm really happy that this is getting ported. I'm I'm not going to get it because I've already played all of these games. And I still have the copies of them that I can play whenever. Something interesting to note, if it is like the HD collection, then Metal Gear 1 and Metal Gear 2 are going to be within Metal Gear Solid 3, because that's how it was on the original PS2 release. Since uh, Metal Gear 1 and Metal Gear 2 are MSX exclusives back in the 80s, uh, they're not the same game as the NES versions, Metal Gear, NES, and snake's revenge which were both terrible games that's just a good thing to note i think the website for the collection specifically mentions that the games are as they were as first released which i think is very interesting wording because metal gear solid 2 and metal gear solid 3 got re-releases on the ps2 uh a few years after their initial release that contained like added content 
So I'm wondering if that means that that content's not necessarily going to be there, or maybe I'm just reading too much into it. I just found the wording interesting. Also, uh, I think it's very unlikely that anything that was added in Snake Eater 3D for the 3DS will be in there either. I'm, I'm sure that that won't be the case. I think it's interesting that Konami, after letting go of Kojima, isn't probably quite equipped to be making new Metal Gear games. And so instead are kind of recycling the design of MGS3 and remaking that game. It is a full remake instead of a remaster or anything like that, to be fair. So they do have to write brand new code, brand new everything from scratch. But they're able to kind of borrow the original design of the game, you know, and kind of go from there. Yeah, that's a really good point because Konami's tried to make Metal Gear games uh, without Kojima many times before. And for the most part, they've always gone poorly. And that also brings up a good point of where, assuming that Metal Gear Solid Delta succeeds, where does Konami go from here? Do they make a new Metal Gear game, which I'm kind of doubting, Mm. or do they then make a remake of, for example, Metal Gear Solid 1? I think all there really is to do is remakes. I don't think that any original games are going to be received super well even if they do well i don't think that they're going to be received super well by the audience yeah and so i think that the only real option for them is to be is to be doing remakes or maybe some remasters like i wouldn't be surprised if we see an mgs5 next gen version or something like that you know i think that those are that's really the only avenue for them to go down one thing that i wonder is if they're going to make a master collection volume two which they're probably planning but they probably want to see how the first one does and what that would contain because i could easily imagine it containing peace walker um but i've heard that mgs4 is more difficult to port because it's made with the ps3's architecture in mind and generally games like that are a bit more difficult to port but uh, I don't know that for sure. I don't work in that field personally. I Yeah, I haven't really worked on that side of things. I don't know how the port... I don't know. It depends because the earlier you go, the more hardware specific games are. And you go until nowadays where all consoles are basically just PCs with basically close to piece, like consumer level PC specs that you can like buy and then build a PC with the exact same specs, which is why porting games is really easy nowadays. Uh, You know, there might be some specific changes for like lighting or something, for example. I've worked on a few games that were like either primarily made for the PS4 or primarily made for the Xbox. And they the porting process was pretty easy going from PS4 to Xbox or vice versa. Some of the things, some of the differences in like lighting or something, just the way that the OS handles lighting uh, was basically a little bit different. But for the most part, it was the same thing. You just hit the export button and then change some specific thing. You basically, you just region out code, you know, if it's a or sorry, define out code. You know, if it's the PlayStation executable, then this amount of then this block of code is excluded and if it's a xbox executable then this these lines of code are excluded you know uh, it's yeah pretty straightforward it defining out code is so easy nowadays yeah i i do think it's important to note that even sony themselves doesn't have a emulator for ps3 games a universal one yeah all the ps3 games on playstation now or on the yeah on the playstation plus service are stream only Mm. but they are working on an emulator for that i believe that's something that they did say i believe last year so it's possible it'd be interesting Uh, i'm not sure what else they would put in that collection besides peace walker and mgs4 possibly portable ops but that one's a bit iffy and possibly actually i could totally see them putting in rising the game's become very popular lately The last thing I have to say about Metal Gear Solid Delta is that I'm not going to write it off immediately just because Kojima is probably not involved in the project. Uh, I'm going to give it a fair shot. I mean, he did develop the original game, so technically he is involved in the project. Uh, Just retroactively. I mean, a long time ago, sure. Yeah. 
the, the main reason why I'm not writing it off is because it is just a remake of a game that he developed. So it's not yeah. really like a new game. It's a remake. It's basically a new game, but they're working off the same baseline, which was a Hideo yeah. Kojima game. Yeah. And from what we've seen, it does look like it's going to be pretty, pretty close to the original. So Towers of Agazba is uh, what I'm going to assume that's pronounced. Uh, it looks pretty cool, actually. It's kind of like a... I think you kind of compared it to like a Breath of the Wild, like a Breath of the Wild-like looking game. And I don't yeah, think that's definitely that that's the wrong. vibe I got from it. Yeah, I don't think that that's wrong. I think it's a little bit more cinematic looking. I think that the Switch couldn't do something like this. So, you know, it's not cell shaded. I think it's like properly shaded. There's a lot more interesting visual set pieces and looks maybe a bit more combat based rather than puzzle based, like something like a Zelda but it looks kind of open air, kind of similar to how like Zelda has kind of been changing. It's kind of been like shifting towards it's uh, I don't know. I think it looks super cool, actually. Yeah, I think it does look really nice. I especially liked the parts in the trailer that were showing those like giant flying animal creatures that uh, you could land on. Yeah. And then um, there was a part where it showed plants growing actively, like very quickly. Yeah. And I thought that those parts looked very nice visually. Yeah, I really like the and, creature design. And of interesting. This. Mm-hmm. There's even a paraglider. This is clearly inspired, at least, by Zelda. Yeah. There was some, like, uh, there was a shot where the character was chopping down a tree, also. <laughs> cool. Yeah, there's a bow and arrow. This is, this is like a Zelda like. I think that that's kind of cool, though. I think that more cinematic type things, which is one thing that I think Zelda has been missing, like, this looks almost Dark Souls in presentation. And I think that that's super cool. I am almost definitely going to play this one. And then we have Final Fantasy 16. I can't be more excited for this one. Uh, Every time we see something about this game, it just looks more incredible. Like every single time. They keep showing us more stuff in the trailers, more story type things, more different kinds of things in the trailers. And I keep thinking, okay, I'm a little worried that they're showing all their cards you know to be fair we don't know much about the plot of this game so for what it's worth we don't we they actually clearly haven't been showing all their cards i don't know i just kind of am worried that we're seeing all the cool parts and then they keep coming out with longer and longer trailers of brand new footage i don't know i just i think that this game looks incredible and i really like the how final fantasy 15 kind of it was still sci-fi like Final Fantasy has been shifting towards, but they started bringing back more of the feudal kind of magic base, like feudal, um, like a medieval kind of uh, society and magic and stuff like that. You know, the main character is a prince and a king and he's the son of a king. And, you know, it is very, you know, high fantasy in some ways. But then this game looks like they're restoring the high fantasy roots even more. Like there's a character that just looks like a white mage. Like it, it, I don't know. I think that's super cool. Yeah, I think this game looks cool. I'm not like, I've only played a couple of Final Fantasy games. So I haven't really been putting this game on my radar. But uh, from what I've seen, I like it. It does look a bit like overly fantasy to me. But uh, okay. that could just be me as somebody who hasn't played like the vast majority of the Final Fantasy franchise, mm. comparing it to the recent Final Fantasy games, just from that perspective, discounting it unfairly. OK, I don't give I don't pass final judgment on a game until I actually play it, though. So sure. But in, in general, I, I haven't had this game on my radar. Looks kind of cool, though. Uh, maybe it's just me because I'm a massive Final Fantasy fan and yeah totally yeah even though they've been shifting more towards more cinematic type things more open world type experiences lately i still kind of love them except for final fantasy 13 <laughs> i think that 13 was kind of the start of that well no because final fantasy 7 they've been building towards this type of game for for a while and 15 kind of felt like a more i guess generic triple a kind of game and that threw a lot of people off i still really really liked it i think that it's interesting that what some of the stuff that they've been saying about it is that they want to step back from the open world part 
which is something that I thought a lot of people liked about Final Fantasy 15, but uh, I guess maybe it was received a bit different in Japan than it was overseas. I didn't mind it. I thought that it was really cool. I thought it was an interesting take on the Final Fantasy game. And I think for this, they're trying to step back from the open world and kind of do a more linear type experience is at least the vibe that I get from what they've been from what they've been saying about this game. But uh, I guess we'll have to see how that ends up playing out. So the next game they showed at the showcase was Alan Wake 2. I'm not sure if this was already announced before this showcase. This game is being published by Epic and is developed by Remedy. This is a series that my brother loves very much. He's played like all of Remedy's releases. And through him, I've seen scenes from them. I've played like a couple minutes of uh, a few of the, their games, mainly uh, Max Payne and Control. And uh, I think their games seem pretty cool just from that. I know that there's a lot of like a shared universe going on between their games also. I don't know what okay. extent that goes to. So uh, their games has been something that's been on my radar for a little bit too, but I, I haven't jumped into it yet. And then they talked about Assassin's Creed Mirage. I've sort of become um, an Assassin's Creed fan. I really liked the first handful of games basically one through three and then i kind of fell off i played a little bit of four didn't really finish it but then lately just seeing a lot of the interesting games that they've been coming out with and trying to follow the story a little bit i've been trying to play a bit more of these Assassin's creed games i kind of did like a mini marathon kind of leading into uh, ac origins and so now i've played every single game except for the last two i haven't played odyssey or Valhalla yet. But I've played every other Assassin's Creed game, including the AC Chronicles and a bunch of the uh, spin-off ones. I haven't played the Altair Chronicles games, although, although I think one of them is on PC and rolled into one of the other Chronicles games. I don't know. It, the AC uh, whole franchise is kind of complicated. I have a love-hate relationship with it, but a lot of the most recent games have been really cool. I think them kind of soft rebooting the franchise from like a stealth game into an open world rpg is really cool i understand that it's not the same thing at all it doesn't they almost don't feel like assassin's creed games in a way but that's why i kind of think that this one is interesting because it looks like a more classic return to form assassin's creed game yeah i definitely see where you're coming from there uh as somebody who i've played the first games up to four and i really loved four but I wouldn't describe it as a good Assassin's Creed game. I would just describe it as a good pirate game. In yeah. My opinion. After that, I haven't played any of the other ones. Yeah, 4 is widely regarded as the best Assassin's Creed game by a lot of the fan base. Or at least it's the fan favorite is what I would say. And I do agree it's a great game. It's a really, really good game. But but yeah, I can understand what you mean. They kind of lost the plot of like the larger kind of plot of like the modern day what's happening nowadays kind of and i don't know they changed quite a bit <laughs> is uh is a better way to put it and kind of have gone in their own direction as far as story is concerned and uh and then they kind of rebooted again when they changed like a open world rpg like i mentioned so that's why i think this is really cool i think that this is return to form we'll have to see what the larger story is and how it kind of uh changes or adds to the modern day story or like future kind of story see where uh what the modern day assassins or abstergo industries or whatever else that the templar what the current story is because if i had to guess this is probably a return to form in more than one way i don't think that we're going to see desmond miles again but I would imagine that they're going to be focusing a bit more on the current day story. Something else from my perspective, uh, this is the first Assassin's Creed game in a while where I've watched the trailer and the series has felt familiar to me again, right. which I think is very interesting. It brings out a bit of nostalgia in me, but I am a little worried because this game looks like games that came out for the PS3 to me from my perspective. Hmm. So I worry a little bit about how this game is going to innovate uh, the gameplay of the series on its own to be unique from the other games in the series, even the much older ones. But still, uh, it's nice to see the series return to a form that is at least familiar to me 
Yeah. The next game they showed at the showcase uh, was an indie game called Revenant Hill, uh, developed by the Glory Society. The trailer for this game seemed like it was just like uh, almost like a, you know, it was a pre-rendered scene. It didn't look like it contained any gameplay from what I could tell. But uh, the PS blog post about this game describes it as plot wise, a journey to become a witch's familiar, which Mm -hmm. sounds pretty interesting. So you do play as the it looked like a cat to me. And the post describes the gameplay as kind of like a community builder game with like even some farming in it. Like you go around a town and interact with the people that live there, build up your character relationships and stuff. So it almost sounds a bit like Stardew Valley, which is very interesting. The game looks like a 2D, almost like a platformer. It didn't really say any that much about combat, so I can't really tell I don't anything think that beyond combat. that. I think this is more like a story type, like 2D platformer. Yeah. So the the blog post at least had screenshots of the game. So you could see some of these aspects. There were some, it did show like a mini game. Like there was like an in-game card playing mini game Mm -hmm. uh, that the character was playing from like a 2D first person perspective, looking down on a table. Mm -hmm. You've seen that kind of scene in a lot of games that have like card games in it. But um. Yeah, that's pretty much all that we got right now, I think. Yeah, I think it looks cool. I really like a lot of the Finji published games. Like, I really like Tunic. I really like a, a, quite a few games that they published. So I'm interested in this one. I think it looks a lot like Night of the Woods, but I don't think that that's a bad thing. So mm. interested to see where it goes. I do really like the visual style. Mm-hmm. The next game that was showed after that was Grand Blue Fantasy Relink. This one is interesting for me because I've played the first two games in this series. Uh, The first game is a mobile gacha game uh, from Japan. And the second game is a 2.5D anime fighter. So pretty different. (laughs) Yeah, they're pretty different. I'm I'm actually very familiar with this franchise's lore because I've put a lot of time into the gacha game. More time Mm. than I would like to admit. And that's not something that I tend to do with mobile games. This was like uh, that game was like an experiment for me, testing out mobile games. Sure. Yeah. So as for Relink, uh, this game's been in development for quite a few years. It was originally being developed by Platinum Games, which it's going to be a hack and slash. So for its genre, I'd say that's pretty promising. Platinum Mm. Games tends to deliver with their games in that genre. The only thing is in 2019 uh platinum games finished i believe it was stated that they finished development on their portion of the game and development was taken back to Psy games themselves and Psy games has been uh working on adding content to the game ever since then apparently okay um interesting dev cycle i i think i still think the game looks good especially visually uh the game looks very consistent with the franchise's art style, yeah. which I always found uh, beautiful, except for some of the really early on stuff from the first game. No, I think it looks cool. I think it looks kind of like um, if I had to compare it to other games of a similar style, like the Tales of games, kind of these not over the shoulder, but like it's a little bit more pulled back than that. But for lack of a better term, like third person over the shoulder styled high fantasy game. I think it looks really, really cool. And I haven't I don't know too much about the Grand Blue franchise, except for I watched the anime, which was OK. <laughs> um, yeah, it was OK. And uh, I thought it was cool. I thought that, it, you know, it looks similar to Final Fantasy 12. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think that Grand Blue's take on the Final Fantasy 12 world, which is called Ivalice. And there's actually a few different games like Final Fantasy Tactics and stuff that take place in the same world and with like the species and stuff like that. You can tell what a lot of the similarities are, you know, like, oh, this is supposed to be a representation of like this species from Ivalice. And this is supposed to be that, you know, the kind of I really like the art style. I think the art style is very Final Fantasy Tactics, for example, also. So I just I think that it's it looks really cool. And I've always tried to get into the Grand Blue franchise, but never really found a good entry point because the first game just did not interest me at all. And the second game, I'm not into fighters. So it's a it's one of those franchises that I've always wanted to really like. 
but never found a good entry point. And like the anime was only okay. So I, I, I liked the anime for what it's worth, but it, it was only okay. So I think that this is actually a really good, I think that I'm going to enjoy this game. I would like a demo. I think that a demo would be nice to kind of figure out how the game will feel in my hands. If that is a good way to put it, but um, yeah, I don't know. I I think that this looks a lot more intriguing to me than a lot of the other stuff in the Grand Blue franchise. Consider yourself lucky because the first game's story, uh, along with all of the side quests, is easily uh, like 500 hours of visual novel reading, (laughs) which I have done. Oh, lovely. Oh, so you can just info dump me. Oh, yeah, I can totally. (laughs) You you can walk me through the franchise. I was in I was info dumping my friends when we were playing versus. <laughs> but um it's interesting that you bring up Final Fantasy because Grand Blue was actually partly originally created by uh two people that were important with some of the early Final Fantasy games. Composer Nobuo Uematsu and art oh, director really? Hideo Minaba, who it says here worked on Final Fantasy V, VI, VI, and Lost Odyssey. Those are some of the best Final Fantasy games. Nine in particular is like, I know a lot of Final Fantasy fans are going to hate me for this one, but look, seven is like the fan favorite. I think that seven is a better video game than nine, but nine is a better Final Fantasy. Nine is one of the best Final Fantasy games ever. So that's that's yeah, awesome. And five was great. All of those games are great. Six. That's yeah, I've awesome. heard a lot of people give those games praise before. I haven't played them yet, but they're definitely something that I want to play at some point. And Oomatsu, Oomatsu, just a brilliant. He's done all the Final Fantasies except for 15, I believe. But he still also like supervised Shimomura for Final Fantasy 15. But I think he he's done. I think every Final Fantasy, a lot of most of the spinoffs and stuff too. So, man, that that's a dream team kind of. I don't know how much they are involved in Grand Blue currently because the first game originally released in March of 2014. In Japan only. But anyways, uh, Grand Blue Fantasy Relink is going to be a hack and slash uh, open world JRPG type thing. JRPG type thing. And it uh, action J- action RPG. And it looks action really RPG. good. Yeah. All right. So after this, speaking of fighting games, they showed some more footage of Street Fighter 6, which is about to release in a few days as of the recording of this podcast. Hmm. I mean, we've already seen enough of this game, probably. This trailer was focused mainly on story, single player elements. And I think that adding the story is a really, really great move for the series going forward. Because generally, a uh, story takes a backseat in a lot of fighting game franchises. It's something that you kind of read about uh, separately from playing the game. Because the game is mostly focused on the actual fighting itself. So I like mm. to see when they incorporate a uh, solid single player game mode into a fighting game. Then they announced a new game, Ultros, which is by Haduke. And uh, I think it's published by Calhoun Heights, from what I can tell, at least. I think that the visuals of this one look freaking incredible. I think it kind of reminds me of like the hands-drawn art style of Hollow Knight, but way more colorful and kind of psychedelic looking. Oh yeah, definitely. From what I've read from the PlayStation blog, uh, this game is your standard Metroidvania. Okay, so actually a lot like Hollow Knight then, if I had to guess. The inspirations are definitely clear, but I I think this looks freaking rad. I don't have a whole lot to say about it because they didn't show a whole lot of it. Uh, they, yeah, this I was mean, one of the shortest trailers in the presentation. But it's probably the one that interested me the most. Okay, so uh, according to the Steam page for this game, uh, you wake up stranded after seemingly crashing your ship on the sarcophagus which is a giant space drifting cosmic uterus holding an ancient demonic being known as Ultros. Trapped in the eternal loop of a black hole, you will have to explore the sarcophagus and meet its inhabitants to understand the part you play. Are you the gruesome breaker of this cycle or can you become a link from destruction to rebirth? That's what it says verbatim. Interesting. Yeah, I think that it looks super cool. That's... (laughs) It kind of sounds trippy. I, I 
this was definitely on my radar. Next couple of things, they showed off Tower of Fantasy or a PS5 release of Tower of Fantasy, at least. This is like a Genshin Impact clone, which is, is kind of like a Breath of the Wild clone, but not really. It's kind of like Genshin Impact again. So I think it looks really cool. I haven't played it. My girlfriend has. She's been enjoying it. Yeah, it's getting a PS5 release, which is cool. And then they also talked about Dragon's Dogma 2. I played the demo for the first Dragon's Dogma. I, I didn't. I wish that I had more of it to play, but I never really got on the full game. Uh, I think it looks really cool. And I think that Dragon's Dogma 2 looks really cool. After those games, they showed some of their PSVR 2 games. They were all uh, third party releases which I thought I was a little disappointed by that. I was expecting Sony to announce something for PSVR or show more of Firewall Ultra. Something interesting, four out of the six VR games they showed are FPSs, which seems pretty standard for VR games yeah, right now. Yeah, that makes sense. But we got um, Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted 2. Personally, I haven't played any of the games in that series yet. Resident Evil 4's VR mode. Uh, this one's notable because... It's different from the Resident Evil 4 release for the Oculus Quest. That release was the original Resident Evil 4, and this one is going to be a mode for the remake. They showed Arizona Sunshine 2, which is another zombie shooter. The first game for this one's been on my radar for a while, but uh, I haven't played it yet. I've been meaning to. Another interesting thing about this one is the trailer. It was like a CGI trailer, but it was made to look like gameplay. Which is it? It's kind of an iffy concept, but at least you like get the gist of what the game is supposed to be like. Mm. But um, I'm really wondering what the actual gameplay is gonna look like for this. Yeah. Um. Then we got Crossfire Sierra Squad, which is the seventh game in the Crossfire series. The series is mostly just multiplayer games. They're just tactical uh, shooters. I think we have a lot of those on the on VR platforms. After that, we got Synapse, which we've seen before. I think it was in it was in one of the most recent state of plays. I think it was and the most recent it looks, one, the last one. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, it looks pretty cool. It has it's a shooter again, but this one has like telekinesis mechanics, which is pretty cool. It's something that we've seen before in other games, but uh, it also has a really good art style. I, I I'm willing to give it a shot. But I'll have to see when it releases. Yeah. And then we got an announcement for DLC for Beat Saber, the Queen Music Pack. And Queen is great. Beat Saber yeah. is fun. Mm -hmm. After that, that was all of the VR announcements that they had. And we went back to the. I think it's cool that they're pushing PSVR 2 more. I think that PSVR 1 wasn't pushed too much. And I appreciate how, in all of the state of plays and showcases and all that, they always take a minute to show some more games for PSVR 2. I think that's really important for pushing VR as a platform. Yeah, and that's why I was kind of disappointed to not see anything like first party from Sony. Right. But, um, we'll it's kind of disappointing. If maybe they have some games in the pipeline for it. Maybe. But anyways, after this, uh, they went back to the regular games. So this is a weird time that we live in where Bungie is owned by Sony and is on is making exclusive Sony content, like PlayStation content. I don't know what world we're living in, but this is just wild. Uh, they showed off a reboot kind of of an old series that they were doing in the 90s called Marathon. And I think that this is really, really cool. I don't know. It's, it's another like PVP only type game, but you know what? I think it's awesome. I think it looks awesome when I was watching it. I was like, I kind of want to, play this right now i trust bungie to make a cool game and this one looks super cool so i'm willing to give it a shot yeah i definitely felt like the visuals in this trailer looked amazing on the ps blog entry for this game they mentioned that this game is going to be another live service title it won't have a single player campaign unlike the previous games but they said that they want to stay true to the universe that this game takes place in they okay. said they're going to have a lot of references to the original trilogy, which is nice for fans of that series. I haven't personally played them yet. Also, another interesting note, uh, the website for Marathon confirms that the game is in development for the PlayStation 5, the Series X and S, and PC, with full cross-play and cross-save. 
So Bungie's still developing multi-platform games under Sony's ownership. I have to wonder if that's maybe partially due to this game being in development before they were purchased. And so there was probably already some contracts in place because I can't imagine Sony being happy that it's going to be on Xbox, you know? I don't think that they're thrilled yeah. about that. I think that they want that they bought Bungie for a reason. So I, I think that that's interesting. That's the only reason why I can see that happening. Yeah, I believe you're right, because I believe if I remember correctly, Sony bought Bungie last year. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. they were definitely working on this game already. Yeah. So some contracts were probably already written. And similarly to the next game, actually, to Destiny 2, the Destiny 2 expansion, I think that this looks really cool. I've played the original. I played the first Destiny and I played a little bit of Destiny 2. Yeah, I think that Destiny was fantastic. I really liked Taken King. Taken King is when Destiny kind of came into itself. It kind of found itself in a way. I think that a lot of the story in the Taken King was really good. And I think that Destiny 2 was trying to introduce a little bit of that, although they killed off one of the best characters in the game, Cade 6. But interestingly, Cade 6 looks like he's back in the final shape, which is what this uh, expansion is called, the Destiny 2, the final shape. All right, so the next game they showed at the showcase was a real gem. Oh, they showed game? They showed game, did they? Uh, yes. I didn't see a whole lot of Concord. game in that. <laughs> yup. <laughs> Concord. Published by Sony, developed by Firewalk Studios. This is probably one of the worst trailers for any video game I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it showed nothing. It was like a spaceship. It looked nice, but it was like a spaceship going through hyperspace or something. There was a PS blog post for this game as well, and the post actually says what this game is. Oh, cool. Uh, so this is going to be another uh, PvP multiplayer FPS, but even the blog post was bare bones. Let me read one of the paragraphs from this blog post. Please do. Concord is a bringing together of peoples. It's the power of games to build connection and inspire social play. The Firewalk team is driven by the type of exciting, unexpected moments and shared experiences that multiplayer games create. Every time you log on is the beginning of a new adventure, and every match is an opportunity for a new story. It's these ideals that define Concord. It's unique universe and vibrant worlds, and it's rich cast of colorful characters. Wait, now, so is this I'm like a PvP here. mission based thing? Uh, it doesn't say. That's what it sounds like. But uh, I'm going to be honest here. Based on that description, uh, I feel like even that doesn't tell me anything. I feel like you yeah. could copy paste that description for, a for lot of most multiplayer games mm. um all the wording is extremely vague could have even been copy pasted from chat gpt <laughs> <laughs> quite sorry honestly, yeah. no i think that that's fair this this trailer was hilarious in that it didn't do anything yeah except look really nice oh it was beautiful like that burger in the trailer <laughs> after this trailer uh sony suddenly surprised us with a trailer for the Gran Turismo film. Right. I don't know anything about this. This is interesting to me because I was there. So what this movie is based on is a true events uh, online tournament held in Gran Turismo 5 okay. on the PlayStation 3. Uh, it was like uh, it was a racing tournament, like uh, get to the top of the leaderboards or something like that. It's been a while. So this movie is based on the story of the person who played the tournament and won the tournament. The prize for the tournament was for the winning player to get to become a professional race car driver for Nissan. In concept, I think it's cool, but I have my reservations because personally, I'm not a huge fan of over-dramatized based on true events films. And mm. judging from several trailers i've seen for this movie uh this, this movie's going to be extremely dramatic i don't know exactly how all of this stuff went down in real life but in general i have reservations about these kinds of films because i prefer historically accurate depictions of past events personally mm -hmm. that being said i did really enjoy the tetris movie but okay. uh this this movie is going to be the same kind of thing 
And after that was probably, I think, the most interesting part of the showcase. They yeah. showed off the PlayStation Project Q is, I guess, the dev name that they're going for, which is a it's a remote play peripheral. I don't want to call it its own console because it isn't it. You can play games off of the PlayStation 5 and then. You can stream them, like remote stream them to the device and then play it that way. It makes sense because they've kind of they haven't been investing in this technology for a while. You can remote play on your phone. Uh, you can remote play, I think, between other PlayStations or something, some kind of weird functionality like that. So they, they've been investing in this technology for a while. So I think it makes perfect sense. That this comes out. Yeah, I think aspects of this are kind of weird, especially at, when you look at it at first, because your phone can do remote play, your PC can do PlayStation remote play with the official apps. The thing that stands out to me the most with this device is that it has a dual sense built into it with all yeah. the dual senses specific features. I think that's cool. Yeah, if that's something that you really enjoy when you're playing like a PS5 game, that could actually be uh, an enticing thing for you. That is something that you can do when you play remote play on an iPhone. Uh, mm -hmm. You can use a dual sense with it. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't work right on the Android. I don't have an iPhone, so I don't know if the DualSense retains the DualSense features through remote play on the iPhone, but I would imagine that it does. Hmm. And I believe it does on the PC as well. This is going to be an interesting case for me because I would actually find this device very useful. I work in a warehouse and at work, I get a lot of downtime. Sometimes I might pull out my phone and connect to my PlayStation and play a little bit of games. When I play these games, it tends to drain my phone's battery. Mm -hmm. If I had this device along with my phone, then I could use that device as a way to keep my phone's battery alive so that I don't have to recharge it while I'm working. I think also for some games, playing it on a phone isn't quite the same thing, especially with the DualSense's specific features. Okay. Like I've played a few games where the triggers, for example, the adaptive triggers are basically treated as two separate buttons because you can like lightly tap but then pull all the way and there's like a different trigger that gets pulled, you know, like playing that on anything except a current gen controller. It doesn't translate the same, you know? Yeah. So it's more like you're getting the actual feeling of playing it where you of playing the game that you don't get from a phone. Yeah. And I've always been a huge fan of uh, game console gimmicks personally. And that's, you know, that's what the dual sense is and all of its features. It's the PlayStation fives, gimmick to try to entice you to play games on it instead of the competing platforms so i like the idea of being able to re retain those features especially with this device especially with its screen size uh, i believe it's, it's going to be larger than most phones are i think it's going to be from the pictures it looks almost tablet size like probably it's probably about the same size as a regular switch I was but that's like steam deck or something yeah like a steam from looking deck. at it one thing i am concerned about is the price Judging from uh, the PlayStation 5's price and the PSVR 2's price, Sony's been a little price happy in uh, in recent years. I mean, the PSVR 2 costs more than a base PlayStation 5 with a disk drive. So this is just a rough guesstimation on my part, but I, I feel like I can't see this thing being less than $200 personally. If it's any more, if it's like 300 bucks, that's going to be a hard sell because the Steam Deck is oh, yeah. awesome and plays games on device and yeah. you can just stream to it anyways. And yeah. Valve's game stream remote play deal is really freaking good. Steam Link is really strong. Nintendo doesn't have anything like that, but Nintendo has lot of first party and third party games developed on it that run natively on device which is pretty important if this is the same price as a switch or as a steam deck but you have to have a ps5 for it it's a hard sell to be fair like it's ps5 quality games with all the features and stuff of the dual sense like you know on the go but it's streamed yeah and just to add a couple of hard numbers in there a, uh, a basic DualSense controller uh, costs $80 brand new, and uh, Sony sells the DualSense Edge for $200 already by itself. Yeah, we'll have to see on the pricing because I think that the concept behind this is really, really cool. Just to add another basis onto this, 
I was a huge fan of the PSP and the PlayStation Vita. And both of those devices could do remote play with the the PS3 and the PS4. It does kind of annoy me that Sony went this route instead of creating another dedicated handheld that could also do remote play on the side. I would have liked to see Sony give a Vita 2 a shot, personally. Seems like that's not the direction that they want to go. Yeah, I don't think, I don't see them making another dedicated handheld console because they've been putting so much R&D into remote play. Yeah. But I don't know. We'll have to see. It almost feels like the Steam Deck is kind of like their dedicated handheld since they've been porting their games to Steam. Yeah, they've been a bit more comfortable with that lately. Yeah. Yeah. So after the Project Q, they also showed another uh, accessory for the PS5, some PlayStation earbuds. I actually think these look pretty cool. Personally, I've been in the market for new earbuds. One thing I really like is the visual design. They do look very bulky. I'll say that. The buds themselves. They also retain the PS5's visual aesthetic, which I'm a huge fan of. My only reservation is that all of this PlayStation accessory stuff looks extremely like like each other. Extremely samey. They all have the same visual aesthetic. The... It's not they're not really like branching out in creativity with this aesthetic. I think I don't think it's wrong for them to try to keep a cohesive design aesthetic across all of their like PS5 devices. It does feel like they could have experimented a bit more with it. But if they just wanted to be PS5 themed, I mean, they nailed it as far as I'm concerned. I don't know. Don't really have too strong opinions either way. I still definitely really like the design. And I think the the earbuds casing that they showed looks uh, really nice. And for, yeah, I think that the casing looks really good. As weird a design as it is, once it's in your ear, the rest of it doesn't really matter, you know? Like, they could have some kind of funky thing coming out of it. It doesn't really affect anything. I think that the visual design is fine. They kind of look like Apple AirPods, but weird. The last thing that we have to talk about is the last game that they showed off which was Spider-Man 2. I played and loved the first Spider-Man. I 100%ed it and 100%ed all the DLC actually for the first Spider-Man. Haven't played Miles Morales yet. I've only recently got a PS5 and frankly, $60 seemed like a lot. I, I, I There's no reason to pay full price for a, what is it like five hour experience or something, but I want to play it. I like the character of Miles Morales and I think that uh, I'm going to have a lot of fun when I get to it. And Spider-Man 2 is basically like the full next game, like the full sequel to Spider-Man. And they're introducing a lot of really cool elements to it, like uh, Venom and stuff. I think that Peter Parker seems a lot more aggressive in this game. And I think that the first teaser that they showed off was Peter and Miles both looking at Venom. So there is and there's going definitely going to be an element of Peter playing as Venom. But then it seems like at some point they team up to fight Venom too, which is really awesome. I just really like the way that they presented this game in the showcase because it was let's see, how long was this? It was a 15, almost 16 minute, just almost pure gameplay. They showed a kind of a cutscene in the beginning and they showed off a few enemies they showed off what looked like the return of silver sable and stuff also but then it was basically for the most part just pure gameplay just this whole one shot of basically a mission happening peter uh them going after the lizard or going after the people going after the lizard hunting the lizard and then trying to go after the lizard himself afterwards like the whole it looked they were playing through like an entire mission except saving the ending for when we played ourselves which I think is smart. So I thought that the presentation was great. I think that Spider-Man is one of the best PlayStation games to come out lately. And I can't wait for the sequel, like the full sequel. Something about this that I noticed that I think is interesting is that so this game is being developed by Insomniac. Insomniac's already released multiple PS5 titles in the past few years, which is significantly higher amount any of sony's other first party studios Mm -hmm. uh insomniac released ratchet and clank rift apart they released spider-man miles morales and then they releasing spider-man 2 and we already know that they have uh marvel's the wolverine in the works as well right 
So Insomniac's going really hard on basically carrying Sony for this yeah. generation so far. And frankly, all of those games are some of the best PlayStation 5 games. Yeah, definitely. So I just think that they're really pushing the boundaries of the PS5 in a really big way. And also pushing out a lot of really quality games, you know, that showcase the features of the PS5 and just are really solid games in and of themselves. You know, there's no Wii. They're not just Wii Sports here. Yeah. Well, Wii Sports is a solid game. <laughs> yeah, no, I know, but it's a tech demo. And so, and like Spider Man isn't. You know, you yeah. know what I mean. Yeah. All right, that's the that's the whole showcase there. How do you feel about it overall? I think that we're in a really interesting point right now because I feel like PlayStation and Xbox have swapped in a lot of ways. So they showed off thirty three games. Only six of them were first party games and a lot of them were kind of samey like we we saw like you mentioned the live services type games that was a lot of what they showed for the first party and i think it's kind of funny because xbox the whole xbox versus playstation debate was basically you know playstation has the best exclusives they're the king of first party you know you go to playstation to play the first party games xbox was the king of third party the games tend to run a little bit better because xbox always kind of had better specs you know so if you're going to play a game you're going to play call of duty you're going to play any of these games really you're probably going to want to play them on xbox because it's going to perform better you know that is the king of third party games that's where you play those games and i feel like this generation is the first one that they've kind of flip-flopped to where Xbox went on a buying spree. And we haven't seen too much from the studios that they've acquired, but they founded a bunch of new studios. And a lot of games that we have seen from them look fantastic, either are fantastic, they're out, and are fantastic games, or they just look really freaking good. And I can't wait for them to come out and to play them, you know? But we have Elder Scrolls coming out. That's going to be an Xbox exclusive. We have Call of Duty. It's multi-platform right now but it's going to be exclusive eventually we have a lot of really really interesting first party games coming out of xbox and i feel like sony now has a lot of the third parties most of what they shown was third parties so it's just it's it's an interesting juxtaposition right that i feel like they've swapped places it's disappointing because it makes me wonder like what sony is doing because I was definitely expecting something, uh, some more, like some bigger hits from this showcase. Mm. And maybe they're holding stuff back because they just really want to show us Spider-Man 2. I've heard rumors about games in the works at Sony, and I'm not going to name what the rumors are. There are things that I, I'd really like to see Sony announce, like sequels to like more of their classic games or like... Uh, that would help. So it disappoints me to see uh, them announcing a bunch of live service games and then only having like spider-man 2 be like the the real heavy hitter of the showcase Mm -hmm. i'd probably see that hell divers 2 is probably their second biggest thing that they showed here from my perspective and that's probably just because it's also a sequel of an older playstation game a a playstation 4 game but sony has multiple games in the works that we have confirmed that they didn't uh have anything for which was really surprising. I thought that we were going to see something for The Last of Us Factions multiplayer experience that Naughty Dog is working on. And that, uh, that I'm also reluctant about because it's a multiplayer game. We didn't see anything about their Wolverine game. We didn't see anything about Firewall Ultra, which is going to be a VR game. That is first party that Sony's already announced and they showed at one of their last state of plays. Um, and we don't have anything in this showcase about Death Stranding 2 which is another, like, it's going to be another heavy hitter for Sony, and they're not showing anything from it. But I I do think we're going to see that at at Summer Game Fest, so that they probably held that back for that. We have more coming down the pipeline, but I think that this was a really solid showcase. I Like I said in the beginning, I went in kind of rooting for Sony. I went in kind of rooting for PlayStation. And I think that there was a lot of really interesting games shown here. I don't think that they're all going to be PlayStation exclusive games. Like I don't see why Street Fighter 6 wouldn't release basically everywhere. I don't see why Final Fantasy 16 wouldn't release basically everywhere. There's no way Assassin's Creed is going to be a Sony exclusive, you know. 
I I'm assuming a lot of on a lot of these things. I don't know what's been announced and what hasn't, but you know, I don't think that all of these are exclusives. Yeah. But you know, I think that it's they did a really good job of showcasing games coming to the PS5. So I feel like it was mostly pretty solid. I just wish there was more first party games. I, I echo your sentiment. And I think that PSVR2 was also pushing PSVR2 games is really important. Uh, I think that it, it would have been nicer to see more first party games. But I also think that third party support for the PSVR is really important. So, uh, you know, give and take. Now that we've recovered and had ourselves a little chat, what did you think? Leave us a comment on YouTube and like the episode. That really helps us out. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at the Low HP Podcast if you want to reach out there. And subscribe if you want to catch more of us on YouTube. We're also on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Links in the show notes as always.